the administration, our secretaries to flight the agenda on the screen. Honorable members, I do welcome you all uh, in this meeting, uh, knowing that even yesterday we were in this meeting and also today, as you have noticed yesterday that we, we did uh, recognize uh, that as you are doing work of parliament, as members of parliament, we are not forgetting that there are people who are day by day, hour in hour, dying in case at end, and the number is rising up. Uh, we did indicate yesterday that we uh, will put them in our prayers. But seemingly, um, we cannot do otherwise uh, as time goes on, the falling off their shelters, the roofs, uh, the missing of bodies of the loved ones, uh, of these families hoping that uh, it must come to an end whilst uh, this disaster will leave people without homes, with those who are living behind, some not having parents, as we've seen this morning in the interview, uh, that people are still not having shelter, those who are in the halls, others in the neighbors, whilst even in those neighbors, they are not sure whether they are safe. There's nothing that we can do uh, except that uh, we must just pray by seeing this honorable members. Uh, can I say that um, we have our visitors with us, and uh, as we are going to uh, give them platform, they will be telling us who is here, who is leading themselves. By this time, may I have apologies. Um, good morning, Chairperson. Good morning, members. Um, we have an apology, Chair, from uh, Malumane. She said it yesterday. She is attending an oversight with another committee. Uh, Mr. Zwane is attending a meeting that has been called for equity councillors to deal with uh, post floods. Mr. Zondi. Zwane, I mean, sorry. No, no, that was Zondi, Chair. That was Zondi. Sorry, Chair. And then Umamu Sbiya is attending another meeting. Umamu Kaula is also uh, having connectivity issues. Umamu, Umamu Van Dijk uh, submitted an apology, but she is in the meeting. She's also having um, connectivity issues, Chair. She's going to have a power outage, but she is in the meeting. And we also have an apology from U, U Chief Lutuli, who will not be attending the meeting. Um, we also have an apology, Chair, from the minister. He is leading the delegation, the South African delegation. Uh, that will be participating in the 59th uh, Venus Biniali, which is being held in Italy uh, from the 23rd. And we also have an apology chair from the DM, who is also in KZN for post floods assessment and the construction work chair. Yeah, that is the chair. Thank you. Oh, we also had an apology from Utat Mama Bolo. He indicated that he'll be in the meeting, but he might have to leave El Chair. Honorable members, uh, these are apologies. Uh, and then, uh, if there's nothing else, uh, can I propose the adoption of the 
agenda. Honorable Malomane is with us. Uh, let's uh, take off this apology. Honorable Malomane. Honorable Malomane. Honorable Adams. Thank you, Chair. Greetings, um, Chair, and greetings yeah. to everyone. My apologies. Today I'm fine. I will attend the meeting, but I've got a challenge because there's no electricity where I'm staying for the past two days. We're having a challenge, so I'll be in and out. So I also wanted to have that apology. And I hope you Thank you, Honorable Maloman. I wanted somebody to adopt the agenda. Honorable Adams, we can't hear you. We don't know what's going on. Person, I move the adoption of the agenda. Can you hear me now? Yes, I do. Thank you. Any second? I second. Thank you, Honorable Maloman. Um, honorable members, now is the time that according to agenda, let's get I didn't write down today agenda. Can you put the agenda again? Oh, we've got uh, almost one item. Can we now uh, give our visitors the briefing by South African Cultural Observatory on the economic mapping of the creative cultural industries in South Africa? 2022 and measuring the impact of COVID-19 on the creative cultural industry in South Africa. Can I give now the leader of the delegation? Thank you. Um, good morning, Honorable Chair, and thank you for the warm welcome. Good morning to the Portfolio Committee on Sports, Arts and Culture, um, to the Director General of the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture, Mr. Busumu Zumkize. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Unati. I didn't see them on the screen. Thank you. Okay. We, we do welcome you, uh, DG, with your encourage. Thank you, Unati, for that. You're most welcome, Mama. Okay. Um, uh, once again, we'd like to thank uh, the Portfolio Committee on Sports, Arts and Culture, together with the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture, for having afforded the South African Cultural Observatory once again an opportunity to come and present this morning the recent economic mapping of the cultural and creative industries. A report that we have recently released last month. Um, I'm not here alone today. I'm here with my team responsible for producing this wonderful work, which they will um, take us through. Um, we have Professor Jen Strobel from Rhodes University who is our Chief Research Strategist at SACO. Uh, he's based in Makanda. Um, he'll be leading today's uh, talk and discussions on the economic mapping of the cultural and creative industries. We also have in our midst Dr. Andrew Hose, who is our resident economist and trade economist at SACO. 
is based in Pretoria. And we have Dr. Sabert Libenberg, um, who is um, responsible for cultural diplomacy, that the work that we do that focuses on cultural diplomacy at, um, at SACO. So the three of them were the core team that were responsible for producing this report um, in, with assistance of some of the researchers who couldn't make it here today, uh, both, both based at Rhodes University in Makanda and here at the Nelson Mandela University at our, at our offices. So the, the mapping study report, or rather the economic mapping report, is one of the flagship products of um, the South African Cultural Observatory. We have been producing this report um, every second year since SACO was established in 2015. Uh, it aims to provide reliable policy and sector relevant information about the economic value of the creative industries in South Africa that can be used to inform sector development and policy. I will not get into the details of what is in the report, um, Honorable Chair, because that is um, their mandate for today. So with your permission, I would like to hand over to Professor Jen Snowball to take us through today's presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Before that, I'm, I'm very sorry, Jean, just a moment. Before that, uh, DJ, I'm very sorry. I didn't recognize our, our, our office, which is the department. And it's um, not correct that I've started with our visitors. I was supposed to start with you, DJ. Uh, I'm suspecting I was just uh, not focusing when I was looking to other things, which were just raised here. Yeah, but now I'm fine. I'm, um, my apology, DJ. Can I give it to you, DJ, the platform? And then after then, uh, Unati, you will direct your team. DJ. Uh, look, good morning, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, thank you very much. Um, when you are business like uh, that is what happens, uh, focusing on the job, getting delivery uh, to the South Africans, uh, we, we understand your person, uh, no problem at all. Uh, fortunately, SACO uh, is uh, the research arm of the department, uh, established exactly for the purposes of helping us make scientific interventions. Uh, based on the information that is much researched about what is happening uh, to the sector. Uh, uh, hence, the executive director, Ms. Onati, uh, has been able to immediately uh, swim uh, when the Honorable Jefferson asked her uh, uh, to do so. Uh, I am with the, uh, um, I greet the, the Honorable Members of the committee and um, also created the leadership of SACO uh, under uh, Ms. Onati, the executive director, uh, which we are hoping that it is also led by a, a woman. Um, and they say, when you want job to get done, give it to a woman. Uh, so uh, we are happy that we've got such an outstanding leadership and uh, her, her team has been doing a great job, Chairperson, uh, particularly during the period of COVID. But just briefly, so that I do not waste time, uh, the main objective when Minister uh, uh, decided in the Zamchetwa to have this uh, particular research was because for too long, uh, the sector has been uh, on the oblivion or the periphery of understanding what is its contribution economically in the country and therefore how it should be supported uh, in line with scientific data that is available. And therefore, then there was a need to do the very first mapping study uh, to determine the impact of the sector uh, on the economy, employment, as well as generally in relation to how is the sector itself performing. Uh, it is at, out against that background uh, that SACO was then established 
we are now happy that uh, they have been able to do a mapping study and now they are at the stage where they also been able to do a number of research and uh, we entered into a partnership with them uh, with a uh, uh, the view through the Nelson and Mandela University, uh, which also was not selfish uh, in drawing expertise from other universities uh, that they will share with uh, the committee today on who do they work with from the researchers on other universities. But this partnership um, is uh, in, uh, over five years uh, that we commit so that there is certainty um, and uh, we then uh, are going to be reviewing that um, uh, so that we see how we proceed uh, at the end of the contract, uh, which we are committed to continue with because without research, we cannot make proper intervention. The research reports that they have done, Chairperson, have been able to assist us in our planning uh, and reprioritization of our areas, particularly following the uncharted classification uh, that is there in terms of the sector and breaking it down uh, on what are the key areas, whether it is heritage, whether it is audiovisual, whether it is uh, entertainment. And uh, so uh, that is how uh, all these reports are used by the department in doing our strategy, but also in looking at which areas are of greatest need for intervention, but also which areas are undermined by our spatial and historical apartheid distribution. For instance, it was able to tell us um, the very fact that uh, we are more central in the areas relating to Western Cape, Southern, as well as uh, to some extent KZN. So now when we do planning, we then have to say, how do we change this? so that all provinces are able to contribute, but also be supported in an equitable manner. That is based on what SACO is able to tell us in their mapping studies. But also then, um, when we looked at the COVID-19, their research was able to tell us which of these domains have been affected most, and therefore which ones are also likely to be able to recover quicker. And again, I guided by uncharted classification, we are able then to say these are the domains where we need more attention and more funding, and there are also more resources. But also importantly, the recent mapping study where they are able to tell us about the trade uh, in the country between our country, uh, that is exports of cultural goods and services vis-a-vis -vis imports. And they have given us a clear awakening call in relation to reversing the trade deficit in ensuring that South Africans continue to consume and more of the Africa, South African products of culture as well as services. And we need to work towards the mindset of South Africans that local is better and that them consume more of Africa of South African content. In that way, our creatives are able to thrive and succeed more. Uh, because then we are creating market access for them. If we export more products, we attract more of what we call direct investment. Just a moment, DG. I'm seeing the hand of Honorable Nishong. Honorable thank, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And good morning. Uh, Apologies, DG. Chairperson, I'm concerned. I think it's a culture of this uh, meeting that when we have any entity, the DG present a deep brief. Now, today it's verbally, and I don't know what happened to it. Why are we allowing it to happen? Because it's a culture that we get a presentation from the department before any entity or any stakeholder. Now, why are we getting a verbal contribution? Thank you very much. My apologies, Chairperson. We, we will provide. I, it was just an oversight based on the when we were looking at the agenda going straight to the presentations by SACO, and that we will then be able to provide the overview. But we, we, we do have it um, 
we will provide to the committee. Uh, I must then, um, I, I, I apologize for that, Chairperson. We were just guided by how the agenda was structured. And then that is why then that is it's what happens. I thought that um, we are just being given an opportunity now to just make a prelude before the committee, before the SACO uh, leadership presents. Um, but I, I might just end there for now, then, Chairperson, and um, accept that um, I can close by indicating our commitment to continue working with SACO uh, in ensuring that. Um, the sector is informed and news evidence based um, and information for us to be able to plan better and service the sector better and therefore make the country benefit from its highly talented population. Thank you very much. Thank you, DG. Thank you, Honorable Mshongo. The DG um, apologize and sometimes um i'll just let the committee go on until the the members uh, raise what you've just raised thank you for that uh, uh, correction and notice um, we do accept your apology DG, not again maybe even the agenda which it didn't indicate but i'm suspecting that that error, it won't happen again. Thank you. Uh, honorable members, let's now give a, a support the opportunity to present as they were trying to present. Um, thank you, Chair. This is um, Jen Snowball. Can I go ahead with the presentation and the screen share? Yes, Jen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I just check that the screen is being shared? Yes, it's it's on. Great. Thank you. Um, well, firstly, um, Chair, Honourable Members, uh, DG, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to share some of the work of the South African Cultural Observatory. Um, I believe that the slides were um, forwarded in advance. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk through some of the results and I'll be very happy to take any questions about the research. Um, Okay, so the purpose of the uh, mapping study, as the uh, DG said, is to provide um, updated information on how the cultural and creative industries contribute to the economy of South Africa in terms of GDP, GDP growth, employment and transformation, and international trade. Um, and this provides uh, the basis for evidence-based um, policy. Um, in this study, we use three main research methods linked to three sources of data. They're all national sources of data. Um, so they're sourced from uh, Statistics South Africa, the South African Reserve Bank, um, the Labor Force um, Survey that is used to calculate employment and unemployment, and international trade databases. This presentation seeks to provide a brief preview of the main results. Um, but the reports, uh, a short report and a longer detailed report are available publicly on the South African Cultural Observatory website. I'm not going to talk too much more about the methods and the data, um, but just to say that it's common in these kinds of mapping studies to use only one source of data. So to use a macroeconomic model, um, in order to estimate things like trade and employment as well. And what we've done here is to use three different methods and three different data sources in order to have internal validity and reliability checks. So all the methods have advantages and disadvantages associated with them. Um, for example, in, if you use the macroeconomic model um, to estimate uh, employment in the creative industries, um, you can do that, but it doesn't tell you about the details. So, for example, um, it doesn't tell you about um, the age profile 
or gender distribution or earnings. And that, so we can get that kind of detailed information from uh, cultural employment uh, data that comes from our quarterly labor force survey and the labor market dynamics survey. And the same with international trade by using separate trade databases, um, we can really understand things like trade patterns, where we import and export from, and in which parts of the creative economy. So for our purposes, we're using the UNESCO framework for cultural statistics in order to uh, define the cultural and creative industries. Um, there are other ways um, of defining the sector, um, but we use this one because it seems to fit the South African uh, sort of policy debates and discussion the best. Um, we uh, do um, change it a bit, we, we, uh, which you meant to do, so you adjust it for what's important in your economy, but it then does allow us also to use this data for international comparison. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the way that the uh, cultural and creative industries are defined, as you can see there on the screen, is into six main cultural domains. Cultural and natural heritage, performance and celebration, visual arts and crafts, books and press, and then the two more commercial domains. So these are the ones that are kind of um, related more to applying the core creative uh, industry inputs, that's audio, visual and interactive media, so that includes film and video, TV and radio, but it also includes internet, podcasting and video games. And then design and creative services, um, which is any kind of design, fashion design, graphic design, but also more um, sort of industrial things like um, architectural services and landscape design as well as um, advertising services. So the presentation is in um, a couple of parts. And the first section is about the contribution of the cultural and creative industries to the economy. Um, the second part is about employment and transformation. And the third part is about international trade. So starting off first with the contribution of the cultural and creative industries to the South African economy, um, the first thing I need to mention is that um, it's good practice in national income accounting every now and then to do what's called rebasing of the, um, the way that GDP is measured in an economy. You might remember uh, some years ago, Nigeria uh, did a rebasing of their economy, and then it was revealed that, in fact, they had one of the largest um, GDPs in Africa. And this is done because the economy changes its structure over time. So um, structural changes happen quite slowly. So some sectors of the economy get smaller, some get bigger. Um, and so there's this need for a kind of a reset every now and then. Now, what this picture shows you um, is the, the pale blue bars are the previous um, size of that particular sector. And the dark uh, bars are the revised um, data from um, Statistics South Africa um, when they did the rebasing last year. Um, and what you can see is that some sectors have got a bit smaller. For example, you can see mining and quarrying is smaller than in the previous uh, model. But one of the big surprises, I think, was personal generally thought. And this is where a lot of the cultural and creative industries are based. And so this is really good news for our sector um, because it means that uh, even though we have had a negative impact from COVID, um, it has actually, it's actually contributing much more to the economy than we, uh, than we originally thought. So um, this shows the contribution um, of the cultural and creative industries to South Africa's GDP, so it's a sort of direct contribution. So you can see um, for 2020, it was 2.97%, so nearly 3% of GDP. Um, this might not sound uh, sort of terribly impressive, but um, it's catching up with uh, sectors like agriculture, which have traditionally received much more attention. 
What you can also see from the diagram is the relative contribution of the different domains. So we can see, for example, that that 2.97% and design and creative services, 32%. And that's what we would expect um, because those are the most commercial applications. Um, what you can see on the inside of the donut are the um, growth rates, and you'll notice that they are all negative. And that's the impact of COVID on the sector. And so the annual growth rate between 2019 and 2020 was negative. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about um, how, that, how that works, um, or which sectors were, were the most affected later on. Um, but you can see that there definitely was big needs. One of the things that has been found internationally is that the creative industries um, are quite a volatile sector. So compared to the rest of the economy, they can grow very quickly at times of economic growth, but they also tend to uh, fall very quickly when the economy starts to slow down. And this is also a pattern that we have seen in South Africa. So if we look at the line graph on the left, we can see that the South African economic growth rate is that dark blue line. Um, and you can see very clearly there the slowdown starting in 2019 and becoming much faster in 2020. And the red line is the cultural and creative industries growth. And you can see that in 2017, when the economy was doing relatively well, so we had sort of slight positive growth rate, the creative industries really grew quickly. But that when the economy starts to slow down, then the creative industries tend to, uh, tend to slow even faster. Um, and there's some attributes of how the creative industries work that can explain that. Um, one of them is that a lot of the work is project-based. So you pull together a team of experts around a particular project, which could be um, an architectural design, it could be a film, TV show, um, a particular public arts project, festival. Um, and then when the project is over, then the individuals disperse again and make new teams. Right? And that's one of the things that makes the sector able to grow quickly and to produce very um, innovative, interesting kind of works, but it does make them vulnerable um, to uh, things like the uh, COVID lockdown. Um, what the donuts um, on the right is showing is how within the creative industries, the different domains have contributed more or less um, from the year 2016, which is the middle um, of the donut, to 2018 to 2020. Um, so I know it's very small, but what we can what we can see there is that some of the domains are growing. Right. So if we look at it over the last three mapping studies, we can see some some positive growth happening particularly in the sort of the more commercial um, parts of the sector and particularly in audiovisual and interactive media. But we can see that some domains were struggling even before COVID hit. For example, books and press um, has dropped from being nearly 18% of the creative industries um, to being less than 16%. So there's some areas that clearly need a bit more help even before the COVID uh, shutdown. So that's a very um, supply side view of how the creative industries contribute to the economy. Um, but we also did use national data to track um, uh, consumer spending. So the demand side of the creative industries. And we can see that if we go back really far, so this goes from 1970, it's an, an index number. So it's just the direction of change. Um, we can see that um, it's, it has been on a sort of slow and even kind of um, increase. Um, and this has particularly been the case since sort of 2008. You can see that most of the categories start to go up. Um, so these are not only um, cultural and creative goods, but it's data from Stats SA that can give us an idea of, of what people are spending on. 
But one of the things you notice is that for three of those spending categories, there's a big significant drop um, from around uh, 2019 and then very quick in 2020. Um, and that's for things related to um, non-durable goods um, and particularly for services. So we see the same picture basically on the demand and on the supply side. One of the things that we've um, paid particular attention to in this mapping study, um, which the, the DG did, did allude to, is to look at the um, geographic spread or the, the spatial vision um, of uh, GDP or gross value added, which is a way of measuring output. Um, and also, uh, as I'll show in a few minutes, employment and trade. Um, now, as found in, in quite a lot of other countries, um, the creative industries tend to cluster or group around metros, big cities. And that's partly because of this need to draw together people from lots of different um, backgrounds and different specializations around this project-based work. Um, and that is sometimes easier to do within cities. Um, we'll see if that remains the same post COVID um, and whether, whether we can, you know, there's more of a sort of spreading out. Um, but we can see from, from the map there um, that this is true in South Africa as well. So the provinces with the biggest metro areas, that's Gauteng, um, the Western Cape, and KwaZulu Natal are also the ones where the creative industries are producing um, the most. Um, but this is not to say that um, more rural provinces don't have advantages in some of the domains. Um, so part of what the mapping study also does is to say, okay, what is the profile of the creative industries in a more rural province like the Eastern Cape, uh, where I currently am? Um, which are the domains where there is already some kind of movement or comparative advantage, and how can we build on that um, in order to develop uh, policy? Right, so having talked about uh, GDP and contribution to GDP, um, what I'd like to do now is to move on to um, talking about cultural and creative industries, employment and transformation, and also showing some of the impacts that, um, that the COVID shutdown had. So there are some characteristics of cultural and creative industries enterprises that make them a bit different from the rest of the economy. Um, this is not particular to South Africa, by the way. Um, research done in other African countries shows the same kinds of patterns, and even uh, research done in Europe, Australia, South America. So the production characteristics that make them a bit special are firstly that there are a lot of small and micro enterprises. Um, we tend to think of the big platforms, Amazon, Google, um, Disney, um, and think, well, it's a, it must be an industry dominated by big players. But in fact, it's not. Um, it's dominated by really small firms. They also have reliance on face-to-face -face interaction um, for both production and consumption. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why they were particularly hard hit by um, the COVID um, lockdowns. Um, on the production side, um, I was sort of surprised to notice that uh, TV was uh, and film were very badly um, affected. And I thought, well, why is that? Because we all stayed at home and, and watched, uh, watched film and, and TV um, so there was certainly a demand for their product. But if you think about how, they, how they, these things are made, it's groups of people getting together um, in quite controlled small spaces um, in a face-to-face -face production mode, needing to travel around to different locations, um, working in editing suites. And so that meant that for a long time, um, it was very um, badly affected. Um, I've talked about the prevalence of project-based income generation. Um, and then for some parts of the sector, like if you think of uh, visual art crafts, um, they were negatively affected, not because they couldn't carry on producing. They could, uh, even during the lockdown, but they couldn't reach their markets because they're reliant on uh, local and international tourism in order to sell a lot of what they produce. 
Um, and of course, that was shut down. In terms of how people work in the cultural and creative industries, there's a high proportion of freelancers, or what Stats SA classifies as own account uh, workers with no employees. So in other words, they are self-employed individuals. Um, there's also a higher proportion of informal work, particularly in developing country contexts, and the importance of networking and events for career development. So what we found is that when, when the networking events were taken away, so when there were no live festivals or there were, um, for example, problems with you couldn't have an art fair um, or something like the Venice Biennale like uh, is going on at the moment, um, the people who, who lost the most from that were actually the emerging creatives because they rely on these kinds of events to showcase their work to talk to other people in the industry and to build those networks for their career development. Okay, so knowing this about how creative industries employment works, um, we were able to use an international method, um, but on, uh, uh, on stats SA data to calculate the size of um, employment or in creative industries to employment. And the methods that's used is called the, um, the cultural trident approach. And that's because you can find creative and cultural workers um, in different places. So part A of the trident is people who are employed in creative occupations, in creative industry. So that would be like a director working in the film industry. But you can also find creative workers in other industries. For example, you might have a designer working in an automotive factory. And then we also have support um, pe uh, people. So uh, people who are in a creative industry but may not themselves be creative. So uh, an accountant in a theatre company, for example. So if we include all of these um, different types of employment, or categories of employment, then we would see that total creative employment makes up about a million jobs, just under a million jobs, um, or 5.9% of all the uh, job, jobs in South Africa. Um, this was in 2019, which was the latest annual data that we had available. And I'll talk more about what happened in 2020 just now. But this also emphasizes that the creative industries um, have a really important role to play in job creation in South Africa, especially for youth. So just like GDP contributions, uh, cultural employment is more volatile than non-cultural sector jobs. So people in cultural occupations, um, which is the blue line that you can see in the, in the line graph, um, they, they, the, the cultural jobs respond very quickly, both to economic growth as well as to economic decline. So if we look at, at this, uh, this diagram here, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse on the left, um, here's the 2008-09 financial crisis, right? Um, and you can see that um, the creative industries had a very negative, like minus 20% impact as a result financial crisis. There was also a drop in uh, non-cultural employment or other kinds of employment, but it wasn't as severe. The recovery, though, is pretty quick. And when the economy is doing well, so here in 2016-17, uh, in then um, cultural occupations or employment is actually growing faster than employment in the rest of the economy. Um, nevertheless, the impact of COVID-19 on cultural occupations and industries was, uh, was really negative and severe. And you can't quite see it here because this graph ends in 2019. But what we did was we used quarterly data to compare what was happening quarter by quarter in 2019 with quarter by quarter in 2020. So that's uh, the bar graph um, here on the right. So the red lines show the drop in cultural occupations, the percentage decrease, and the blue shows the uh, percentage change in all the other jobs, non-cultural occupations. So what we notice is that um, in quarter one, there's already 
an, an immediate impact right, of a slowdown on uh, creative occupations, and that this becomes very severe in quarter two, so minus 30%. Um, so remember, this is national household data, so it's picking up formal and informal employment. We can see that nationally, uh, all, all jobs reduce by 13.9 or 14%, but cultural jobs drop by 30%. Slight recovery in quarter three and quarter four, but still a much worse impact on the sector uh, than there was the economy. Okay, so um, we looked at the share of the different domains on GDP, um, and, and this is showing you the same sort of thing, but for, um, uh, for jobs, for employment. And I think one of the, the things to point out here is that um, the, the GDP contribution and the number of jobs don't always match up. And that's because in some sectors, um, you get a few, but very high paid jobs. Um, in other sectors, you get many, but perhaps lower, um, lower paid jobs. And the, the example here is visual arts and crafts. So although visual arts and crafts only contributes 13 or 14 percent to the whole uh, creative economy, um, it makes up around uh, 44 percent of all the jobs in the cultural and creative industry, um, which is an interesting thing to note. So kind of a policy implication of that would be, well, if you're wanting to uh, go for job creation, um, then that would be a good sector to target. Um, and the Cultural Observatory has done some detailed research into that sector to get a sense of what the employment profile is. Um, employment type is also from a labor force survey uh, data, um, and the classifications are working for somebody else for pay, so that would be as an employee, an employer, so uh, you're actually um, hiring people, a business owner, um, there's the own account worker with no employees, so that would be the freelancers, and then helping without pay, which is volunteers. Um, so the biggest difference that one can notice in terms of cultural and non-cultural jobs is that um, there are far more people in non-cultural jobs who are employees, who are working for somebody else for pay, for a salary, um, so 84% so of people in, in the general economy work for somebody else, with only 60% in the cultural sector. So where are they? Well, they're here. They're the freelancers, own account workers with no employees. So more than a third of people in cultural occupations are freelancers, um, formal or informal. Um, and that's one of the attributes that makes the sector particularly difficult to support. And how do you get hold of the freelancers to find out what they need and um, how to support them. Um, and they also typically don't have kind of social security nets. So if you're a freelancer, um, you wouldn't have medical insurance unless you bought it yourself, but you wouldn't have it through an employer. You also wouldn't be, have access to unemployment insurance. What about transformation? The report has a lot to say about um, gender, about different race groups um, and about different age groups. Um, but what we can see in, in tracking transformation is that uh, workers in cultural occupations are becoming more representative of the population. Um, so you can see that more than 80% of people um, in cultural occupations are Black African colored people or Indian and Asian people. But what we can also see from this uh, is that the youth or the younger um, people in cultural occupations are more representative of population demographics than the older age groups. So um, the, the blue bars and the red bars are the younger age groups. So the blue bar is the youth up to 34. Um, and then the red bar is the middle, so 35 to 49. And then the green bar is 50 plus. Um, and what we can see is that transformation is improving as time goes by um, and that the younger groups are more representative than the older groups. So this is a trend that as will naturally continue um, as older uh, 
Empire. One of the good news stories that came out of um, the cultural and creative industries research that we did was that in South Africa, uh, women were in, in cultural occupations were not as badly affected as in other sectors or even in other countries. So internationally, um, it was generally found that the recession that happened as a result of COVID-19 was worse for women than for men. Um, but in South Africa, this doesn't appear to be the case. So what we're looking at here again is quarterly data. So here's quarter one, this time divided into women and men. Here's quarter two, women and men, quarter three and quarter four. So we can see that there was a drop in um, a cultural occupations for both women and men, but especially for quarters two and four, it was more severe for men, so minus 39, than for women, minus 16. Um, and that's an interesting finding because it means that if you're looking for ways to um, kind of build gender um, equality, then the creative industries look like a sector where the women who are working in that sector are in relatively good, stable jobs, right? Um, which was not found in other countries. The geographic spread of employment looks very similar to GDP contributions. Um, so we can see that the, uh, the three provinces that are, um, have the biggest share of cultural occupations are Gauteng, KwaZulu Natal, and the Western Cape, which is um, sort of what we would expect. Um, but like with the GDP, there are definite opportunities for more rural provinces um, to, uh, to capitalize or to build on. Um, the cultural and creative industries. And there, there's some quite interesting surprises. Look, Limpopo has got 10%, um, which was maybe higher than one might expect, and then followed by the Eastern Cape. Right, finally, I'd just like to talk a little bit about international trade um, in cultural goods and in cultural services. So South Africa's cultural goods trade, um, we tracked uh, over long time periods. Um, you can see that um, the blue bars here represent the value of cultural goods exports, and the red represents the value of cultural goods imports. And you can see the sudden decrease in the second quarter of 2020 in both imports and exports. But after that, there, there are two interesting trends. Firstly, the speed of the recovery is really remarkable. And so there's a very sudden V shape. But by quarter four, um, we kind of back um, where we were before, the, um, before the, the lockdown happened. The other thing that's interesting is that for the first time in 20 years, we actually have a cultural goods trade surplus. In other words, the value of South Africa's cultural goods exports is more than the value of South Africa's cultural goods imports. So that clearly uh, points to growing importance in that sector. In terms of which domains are, are importing and exporting the most, um, visual arts and crafts is our clear leader in goods trade. And so this is in uh, goods, not in services. Um, and this is actually something that's been noticed internationally. So some of the UNCTAD reports also mention that South Africa is one of the top 10 developing country exporters um, of visual arts and crafts. That could be something good uh, to build on. And even going back as far as 2016, we can see that the value of our exports in that domain was more than the value of our imports. The other weird thing that you're probably thinking, what's going on there, are these two domains at the end. So these are the more commercial domains, audio, visual, and interactive media, and design and creative services. Where is their trade? And the answer is, it's not in goods anymore, it's in services. So this is goods trade, and generally economists are better at measuring trade in cultural goods than they are in services. And this is just not a South African only problem. Um, it's, a, it's a worldwide problem, right? How do we track services trade? Um, and this has happened because a lot of the trade in those two domains has dematerialized or become digital, if you think about it. So nobody exports videos or 
DVDs or CDs anymore, right? Um, it's all stuff that you can access online. The same thing applies to architectural plans. You know, you can see if you look at the uh, the goods trade data, there's this category for architectural uh, plans and blueprints. But of course, none of that happens in hard copy anymore. It's become digitized. So there is a challenge in measuring what's happening in those two domains. So in order to try and fill the gap a bit, um, we accessed some South African Reserve Bank data, which tries to track trade in um, non-material goods, in services, in other words. Um, we don't have access to the, um, to the disaggregated data, but some of these categories would include um, cultural and creative services. Um, for example, charges for the use of intellectual property, um, so that's all kinds of IP, which would include cultural, but also agricultural and industrial. Um, and the, the interesting thing here is that South Africa um, pays a lot. So this is in billions of rand um, for intellectual uh, property. If we look at the personal, cultural and recreational services categories, we can see some green lights, right? So this means that the value of our uh, exports is more than the value of our imports. Um, and that's happening here, audio, visual and related services and other cultural and recreational services. Who do we trade with? Um, so when we're looking at our goods trade, where are our main markets? Um, in terms of who buys our stuff, um, that's basically, this is the North American, what was the North American free trade area, right, which is now called USMCA. Um, so 39% of what South Africa produces in terms of cultural goods goes there. And then to another 22.5% to the EU, including the UK. So those are the biggest markets for our goods. But what's also happening is that the African market is becoming increasingly time, um, we're trading more with other African countries, both in terms of imports and exports. Um, where do we buy things from? Um, well, there's this category, rest of bricks, so that's Brazil. That is from China, right? So a lot of, of cultural goods imports uh, come from China. They are a very important um, trading partner for us, uh, as well as the EU. Um, using a very interesting data set based on postal codes, um, we were able to track the geographic spread. Uh, um, so where are the cultural and creative industries exports coming from? Which provinces? Um, by now, it would not be a surprise to you to note that it's the three um, most active provinces or the provinces with the largest metros. Uh, what is surprising is that uh, more than half comes from the Western Cape. Now, this could be because the Western Cape has a port and an international airport. And so what might be happening is that um, cultural goods produced in other provinces are being exported through that port. Okay, So we have to just say it's probably not as extreme as that. Um, but very interesting that um, in terms of reaching international markets, the Western Cape is very important for South Africa. So just to wrap up, um, the mapping study covers a whole lot of other things. So these were the three main chapters, that's GDP contribution, employment, and also uh, international trade. Um, but in order to improve the sort of policy relevance of the report, we included two um, other chapters. The first one is what you call provincial profiles. So this provides the kind of information that I've been talking about at national level, but in a much more detailed provincial level. Um, so it looks at um, specific exports from specific domains. So that map is showing you uh, cultural and natural heritage. It talks about the creative economy in each province, um, what's happened to employment over time, um, what is the percentage of formal versus informal jobs, what do earnings look like, what does transformation look like. And it also talks about international uh, trade. 
and identifies the domains within each province where there is already some evidence of, um, of growth. In addition, uh, as you can see from the table up here um, on the right, it looks at um, the contribution to gross value added, kind of a measure of productive output um, of the creative economy in each province. So this is for the Eastern Cape and it's over time. So we can see that in 2016, um, the creative economy contributed 2.5% to the GDP of the Eastern Cape. Uh, that then declined over time as the economy of the province and the country slows down. And for 2020, it was minus 3.4%. So it provides more nuance if you're thinking about provincial uh, policies. What does the creative economy look like in your uh, particular economy, uh, province? So we've done that for, uh, for all of the provinces uh, in this there's also a chapter taking the long view, so the creative economy in historical context, um, and this helps us because we can look at what's happened in the past, where we've come from. Um, it maybe speaks to policy changes that have happened, um, sort of big picture changes, for example, uh, the shift to focusing on the creative economy, um, and maybe some lessons for sort of recovery. Um, as we look at past um, experiences. Um, this also applies to cultural occupations over time. So this is talking about the number of people employed in cultural occupations in South Africa um, and um, the percentage of total employment that this makes up. Um, and so one of the things we can see here, for example, is that uh, the sector was really um, damaged structurally in some ways um, by the 2008-9 financial crisis. So um, although uh, the, the percentage of cultural occupations has um, remained fairly steady, we've never gone back to the number of people working in cultural occupations in the, uh, before the, the great financial crisis. <clears throat> this is the um, cultural goods trade that I was talking about. So here you can see the 20 year span. The orange line at the top shows the value of cultural goods imports. And the, um, the blue line at the, at the bottom shows the value of cultural goods exports. Um, and you can see that for almost this whole more than 20 year period, um, uh, the value of cultural goods uh, imports was much more than the value of cultural goods exports. So this would be a trade deficit, but that more recently um, that switched around, right? So um, they're actually positive foreign exchange earnings from cultural goods exports. So finally, uh, what has the, the mapping study um, shown? Well, uh, firstly, that South Africa's creative economy makes a really val valuable contribution to the economy um, as a whole, um, to employment and job creation, and also to international trade. By using the UNESCO framework, we've also been, show, been able to show how it contributes to the sustainable development goals. So there isn't a sustainable development goal specifically for culture, but there are indicators that have been developed, which are shown on the graphic uh, on the left-hand side. Um, and so we can demonstrate now how um, the creative economy in South Africa also contributes to the sustainable development goals. Um, what we also need to, to emphasize though, is that in the, we've really looked at the market impacts of the sector. So we haven't talked at all about the cultural or intrinsic value of the sector. So we know that the creative sector does a lot more than just make jobs and, and uh, increase production and trade. Um, it also contributes in very important ways to things like social cohesion, um, to sort of identity formation, to uh, transformation. Um, but that's not what this report is primarily about, right? This is an economics report. We can see that the sector has been damaged by the COVID-19 control measures, but um, there are signs of a, a slow um, recovery. Um, 
there is a need to support the sector, um, particularly if we look back at the 2008-9 crisis and we see that, you know, without support, um, there may be some quite uh, sort of ongoing impacts, negative impacts. Um, and from uh, sur other surveys that we've done where we've talked specifically to those working in the sector, um, there are a few areas uh, where they really need help. Um, the first one is that there needs to be some kind of enabling mechanism for micro enterprises to pivot to hybrid business models and how to monetize that content, so how to manage their intellectual property. Larger firms have managed it better. They've got uh, more uh, capital, that's human capital or skills, also money, so they could buy equipment, they could upgrade their websites. Um, but the smaller firms have really struggled to compete in, in, a, in a very difficult online environment. Some of them have managed to, um, uh, to keep their audience, so it's, it's not that they're not getting website traffic, they are but they haven't been able to effectively monetize that or to earn money from their intellectual property. As I also mentioned a bit earlier, early career creatives who don't yet have the networks that they need to operate in the gig economy are also struggling. And uh, interviews with key stakeholders showed us that leaders in the, in the um, industry are very worried that um, uh, creatives, young creatives are exiting, right? they're leaving the industry um, because they, they just can't make it without those established um, networks. Um, we also wanted to point out that trade offers a real um, possibility at the moment. It's a small percentage of South Africa's total trade, um, but it's shown a quick recovery and there's this um, potential for um, increasing the cultural goods trade surplus. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about the report, as I've said, they're all available on the website. Um, we've got lots of interesting infographics and other information that I haven't um, had a, a chance to, to mention here. Um, for example, one of the innovations of this study was to of income within um, the different domains and compared to South Africa as a whole. One of the um, findings that, that we found very encouraging is that um, compared to all of South Africa, income distribution in the creative economy is more equal. So it's got a lower Gini coefficient than South Africa as a whole. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions through you, Chair. Oh, thank you, thank you, Jean, uh, for listening with interest. Uh, honorable members, this is the first of kind that you are having. Uh, of South African Cultural Observatory uh, on making of economy. It is so interesting. Uh, I'm suspecting that we've got a lot of things which uh, now is the time. Uh, they all remember the chance to ask the heads of my policy. Yes. Honorable members are still in the platform. Uh, this is time for questions. Honorable Adams. So far, I've got those two hands. Chairperson, uh, um, yes, Dennis Joseph, thank you. Yes. Chairperson, Chairperson, Martin Gozia. Yes. 
You are cutting very yeah. badly. I, I, I can hardly hear you, Jefferson. Really? No, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, Honorable Martin, because even yesterday I was in heaven, time that I was kicked out. So I'll try my best, but now the chance is for us. Thank you for notifying that. Are you also having the same problem of network, Honorable Martingos? Honorable Martingos, are you having now also the problem uh, of network? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Let, let me close the, the, the um please. The yes, video. yes, close your video. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, <clears throat> can I can I get on Chairperson? Yes, honorable <laughs> member. Thank you. Um let me um um welcome the, the presentation from SACO and um, the information that uh, they, they've given us. And also I'd love to, to welcome- Honorable, Honorable, Honorable my apology, uh, uh, my Yo. member of the committee. Uh, even yesterday, I've forgotten to introduce that uh, this committee we have been joined by Honorable Jafta, replacing a uh, our pass on a uh, uh, honorable Chaisa. Even yesterday, he was part of the committee. I'm very sorry, uh, honorable Jafda. I was supposed to do this yesterday. And even today, I nearly forgot. You are welcome in this committee, honorable Jafda. Uh, uh, honorable Majengos, thank you for allowing me to just interrupt you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, we'd love to uh, welcome another chapter. Um, yes. Yes, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, excuse my voice, my voice is a bit uh, rush. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, take uh, first of all, um, yes, as, as I was uh, saying, um, I appreciate the, the, the presentation. And uh, I've, I've got a few questions that, that basically the question would be bouncing straight to the Department of Sport, Arts and Culture because uh, Sago is, is, is um, observing and showing us, uh, you know, uh, how, how it would be done. And uh, I think uh, the, the department would be looking at it and see how it would be done. Um, like looking at, at the... At, at, at how the 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 money is you know are, are, are being uh, you know out the, there's, there's a lot of outflow that is is uh, being created by by how our music and and our our film industry is being um, imported uh, is is there no, any other way that the department would would be looking at it where it is our 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 music is is being played more within the country than to be having uh, overseas music being played there because there's a lot of money that is being, uh, you know, shipped out of the country. And uh, I think that that would work into, into uh, creating more jobs and, and uh, making our, our sector uh, well and uh, more uh, product, productive for, for people. And um, another thing is the, how, how how is is, is Sako, uh, assisting in, in, in making sure that our our our, our visual arts uh, are, are more are more uh, in in, in um, they, they are more the trade is more based on on, on from our side rather than uh, coming out and and, and um, uh, importing you know the uh, the, the whole trade in, in industry is, is more like about what what we are getting from rather than what what we are shipping out. Um, and, and the question that I have also uh, is of of uh, of Sarko is uh, if uh, Sarko is using the 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 framework of uh, UNESCO, which is um, is is as old as from 
2009, uh, how current is Circle's plans uh, um, about, about the, 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 the creative mapping of, of, our, uh, of our industry and based on, on, the, on the constant, uh, constantly changing, you know, um, economy? So <clears throat> I think that they, 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 they should be using um, a more current, uh, you know, uh, framework than the old one. Um, another question that I have about uh, this, uh, okay, I'm, I'm hearing uh, Sago is talking about the, the, the sector, uh, referring that the, the sector right now is, is the, they are they're seeing younger people being living in the sector, but I don't know where they, they're looking at it because where I'm, where I'm looking at uh, from, like I'm seeing more younger people getting involved within the, this, this, um, uh, uh, you know, sector, and based on, on the historical past, while South Africa was uh, cut out from the world uh, because of the apartheid, our music uh, was more like uh, used and, and, and being consumed within, and moreover, a lot of our people were, were, were benefiting from it. Now, I think that it is time that also we start looking from within so that we don't have to uh, watch our our, our our music being diluted and, and being, uh, uh, you know, confusing our, our younger people as to where to from here. And uh, <clears throat> for the last time, Chairperson, um, it, it is clear that South Africa is focusing on, on trading with US and UK more than it trades with Africa, uh, based on, 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 on what SACO has, uh, you know, has been showing us. Is it not uh, the right time that the Southern government uh, should be changing the picture now and start trading with Africa so that we can uh, uh, grow more than, than to, to be making other, other industries from outside Africa to grow? I saw from there, Chairperson. <coughs> so. <clears throat> I take care of that flow, Honorable Mashangosa. Get to drink some hot stuff, warm, not hot stuff as stuff, <laughs> hot water and honey and lemon, you would be better. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Honorable Adams. Thank you, Chairperson. Can you hear me, Chairperson? Yes, Honorable Member. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, good morning to all members of the committee, the staff led by DJ Mkize and the invitees, and also welcome the presentation. It was really very interesting to listen. Chairperson, my questions will be on the South Africa Cultural Observatory. What research has the South African Cultural Observatory undertaken on leverage, leveraging digital technology and innovation in growing the cultural and creative economy. What impact would the localization policies for TV and radio have for domestic empowerment and geographic spread of cross value added? Uh, chairperson, and then when calculating the value of the South African cultural and creative economy. What are the estimates of the informal sector, which is relatively vast in the creative sector? Chairperson, and then a question on um, crisis on the cultural and creative industries in South Africa. My question there is in terms of the relief funding, provided by government and other non-state actors. What has been the impact of such interviews in interventions? I will stop there, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Adams. Uh, Honorable Denise. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you for the uh, presentation to us from the Snowball and the DG. I would like to start off with uh, a, a comment 
Um, I'm not sure if, if, if the industry that, that was referred to is unionized or the trade unions involved. I don't know. It doesn't sound like it. Uh, of course, what I, what I didn't pick up is that there's no link to, to NETLEC, you know, when government and business meet and if the industry is also represented there, even if they are not, uh, uni uh, they're not uh, linked to unions. Um, I just feel that their voice should be heard there as well, at the, at the highest level, or through the department. Um, my question, Chairperson, is um, relating to a um, comment made by, by Ms. Snowball about the small role players. Um, I'm not, she didn't give examples of, of small role players in the industry, um, but she, she mentioned the self-employed people and the informal work. Um, and I think we need to we need to hear a little bit more about the informal work, uh, the informal industry, or the informal economy, or the informal sector. We need to hear more about that um, because I think the informal economy or sector uh, is it's an underestimated sector. It, it it could provide up to five six people per household on a daily basis to survive. And I think the the um, cultural and creative industry is playing a big part in that. And I would like to to know if they have done if they done the research on the on really informal, um, not just the um, uh, cultural creative, but how does it fit into the bigger inform, informal economy itself? Um, Chairperson, to the DG, I I would like to know. Where in the department sits this directorate? This this um which direct sorry, which directorate it, it sits in um the the um, CCI. Um and 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 if there are specific mandates uh for the uh SARCO to carry out, uh if they have specific mandates per, per year or per financial year. Besides the, the, the general research, but if the if the department gives them specific mandates, if so, what what were the mandates or tasks for them to uh, to do research on? The DG said local is better, and I support that, and I think we all must support it's proudly South Africa. But I'm not sure, Jay, if it's always cheaper right? because we are competing against uh, Chinese and other markets. Uh, so it's also about about affordability. Um, the question I want to raise uh, relating to geographical spread, the employment. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, was raised there are rural provinces and metro metros. What what advice do to um, uh, Salco has for the department in terms of how can we promote the rural employment in terms of the sector? Um, because it seems to me all sectors, the rural is always last in the queue. In terms of investing and promoting and and um, building capacity in that areas and bringing opportunities to the rural uh, provinces or rural towns. Um, my last point, Chairperson, um, is about um, the benefits. Um, um, it was said that the value of South African cultural goods and exports is more than the imports. Now, it's a very important statement. Um, but I would like to know who's the beneficiaries of this um, uh, exports. Is it the bigger companies, or coming back earlier, as as uh, as the lady said, the smaller um, the smaller role players? And how does the informal um, sector in this economy benefit through the through the exports, or is the benefit beneficiaries only companies, or how does the individuals also? In the industry, because we've heard about sixty percent that are, I think, from the individual uh, worker side. How do they benefit from the exports, or what um, support there is for them to get the to get the products out uh, in, on the international market, and as my colleague said, in the Africa market um, earlier on. Um, for now, that's my questions. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honourable Dennis. Initially, I was having the hand, which I noted of Honorable Mshlongo, but I can't see this hand now. I don't know whether he has been kicked off by the network. Um, may I'm I, here, Chair. 
Oh, okay. Honorable Mshlongo, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Chair, welcome the presentation. <clears throat> Chair, I wanted to find out uh, the composition of SACA, uh, its composition and its budget, and how are, uh, how are they within the department? Uh, when I ask about composition, how many people are employed in, uh, within the uh, department structure? And another issue I wanted to find out, have they done a research, the impact of COVID, especially in the sector? And what was the outcome? And another issue, the contribution by the department to the sector. Uh, did they speak to different stakeholders when they do this research? And the, uh, what sample did they use if they have? And uh, one of the questions that I wanted to ask again, it's uh, regarding the, um, how does South Africa cultural goods trade compared to other countries on the continent? And one of the things that I wanted, even the last question to ask about, can they give us a breakdown of job within the econ uh, creative economy terms part-time visa v full-time. Thank you, Chair. Your Honorable Mshongo, the next- Was I Honorable honor Chair? Yes, yes, Honorable Mshongo. The next Honorable Member is Honorable Malomani. Honorable Thank Malomani. Thank you, Honorable. Thank you Thank so you, much. Honorable Chair. Can you hear me, Honorable Chair? Yes, I do, Honorable Malomani. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable Chair. Greetings to everyone. Let me also take this opportunity to welcome the presentation. Uh, my question it will be based on the issue, but the challenge is that the slides, the numbers of the of the of the presentation, I'll go. I'll make it a slide. I've got slide number twelve, which is the issues that speak about the contribution to the GDP. I just want to find out how does this information guide the department? The information is that they, it's provided by SACO that gives insight into the contribution of various domains to the national GDP. How does this information guide the department's funding model for public entities and its range of programs and that support the CCI and cultural and creative workers? The other question is referring to the consumer spending on CCI. The, the concept of durable goods refers to goods that can be used repeatedly or, or continuously over the period of considerably more, more than a year and have a relatively high purchase rate. It is interesting to know that the spending on this has increased steadily since at least 2002. I just want to find out what this what prediction can SACO make with respect to the purchase of these goods post the COVID-19 pandemic and the in, in the prevailing economy? If there is a slowing down in the purchases, hypothetically, what impact will this have on the ACH, ACH sector? The other one it will be based on the issue of transformation. Uh, what is the date for the information provided on this slide? Which is, I take it as slide 22. The full study published on the SACO website knows that this is information for 2019. Does the SACO have any updated information on this piece of information to transformation in the creative sector? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Malomane. Um, the next honorable member is Honorable Mamabulo. Yes, I also appreciate the presentation. I'll choose straight to the questions uh, um, regarding SACO. I mean, uh, Chair, I mean, having noted that South Africa has a trade surplus in cultural and natural heritage trade and visual arts and crafts and so on. Natural heritage is a space that can be further develop, developed by the country, while visual arts and crafts can be promoted across ge geographical spread of our country. How can South Africa chairperson unlock these areas of um, 
strength to ensure that uh, opportunities and the the redistributive to benefit the poor, the youth, women, people with disabilities, and those in previously advantaged locations. How can um, um, Sako assist with that? The other question will be, what are the unemployed growth pro prospect of the cultural and creative economy, and what are the key interventions that government can do to assist in the industry? The last one will be about BRICS. Remember, um, in BRICS, we have us, India, South Africa, which is us, Brazil, and uh, China. The three deficit with, with BRICS can significantly be high um, on high demand. How can we promote our cultural and uh, creative industry goods in China, um, noting that they've got a bigger population? Chairperson, uh, maybe to promote in China because I think we've got relationship already um, as a country with, with um, the British countries. Um, uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Those will be my two or three questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Honorable um, Mama Bulo. By this time, there's uh, so many questions. Uh, maybe we can do a follow up if it's necessary. Now, can I give it firstly uh, to the to our circle visitors, and then uh, the DG will come later. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you um, to all the members for the um, for the very interesting questions. Um, Chaba, I see that you are also with us. Do you want to say something first? Okay. Thank you, Jen. Um, I think from my side, I want to let you uh, respond to the technical uh, questions regarding the report. Um, but to respond to the question that was asked by the honorable member, Regarding um, you know the 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 SACO, um staff uh, or employment numbers. First of all, I just want to um, explain that SACO is hosted by the Nelson Mandela University in Kabeja. So the core staff, uh, full time and part time. Uh, workers or employees or team members that are involved on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with the SACO project from an administrative point of view, including myself. We are based in Kabeja at the Nelson Mandela University, and there, is there are 17 active team members, starting from myself right up until the, you know, the lowest um, uh, person, which is um, our interns. So that's the that's the the first one, and that's obviously excluding our partners because the, Sako is hosted in partnership with Rhodes University in Makanda, um, the University of Forte in Alice and in East London, and the University of KwaZulu Natal. Um, each of those institutions that I've mentioned has got what we call a liaison person. In the case of Rhodes University, our point of call is Professor Jen Snowball, who is the lead researcher for the Mapping Study Report. And she's got a team of researchers, um, academics primarily, that she works with um, on the number of deliverables that we've produced. SACO has produced um, hundreds of reports over the years. Uh, over 100 of uh, reports over the years since we've started uh, working on the SACO project in 2015. All our reports are on our website available because as soon as we complete each batch of reports, we send them through to the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture. They review them, they sign them off when they're happy with them, and then we upload them on their website so that the industry um, academics, students, or anyone who's got an interest in the cultural and creative industries can access um, the, the reports um, that SACO has produced over time. So, and to answer then the issue of the COVID-19 um, 
studies. Yes, we have actually done COVID-19 impact assessment. We did one during um, the early stages of the, the lockdown in 2020, in May 2020, which was an early assessment of the impact of COVID-19. And we had um, another one done a year later, which was done by the team. But I would let my colleagues who are here today just to take you through just the uh, you know, the key highlights or broad um, highlights and overview of what the findings were and how many stakeholders uh, we, we 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 engaged with and what 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 were the findings of that report. So thank you, Jen. Over to you and Andre and Sabert. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Unati. Um, perhaps, uh, Chair, if, if I could just share a little bit more about the uh, more microeconomic COVID-19 impact study that SACO did to address some of the questions of the members, would that be fine? Yes, please. Okay, so I'm just going to share the screen quickly because some of these things are easier when there is a thing to see. Um, so so um, Unati was referring to the fact that we have been tracking um, the on the ground kind of impact of the uh, COVID-19 um, shutdown on the creative industries. Um, and we've been doing that over time. So we had a study early in 2020 and another one uh, sort of follow up uh, last year. Um, and this is not only to track the impact, but also to um, see what kind of adaptation strategies um, have been used. Um, this shows you where we got the information from. So it was a, it was this is an online survey that we did. Um, we had to work online because of the um, COVID restrictions, um, but we supplemented that by talking to industry key stakeholders. Um, for example, um, many of the domains have um, their own industry organisations, although. To refer to a question earlier on, um, they are mostly not unionized. Um, and this is because, as we said, about 35% of people working in the sector um, overall are freelance, and um, about 46% of them are working informally. So this shows you who we got information from in 2020. Um, this is from the online survey. Um, so uh, these are the different sort of characteristics, and you'll see that we heard from um, formal and informal businesses. We heard from employers and freelancers and from um, different uh, ways of working in the sector. Um, these are some of the demographics that we were tracking. I won't spend long on that, um, but what I did want to... Uh, just move to show you is that um, we asked about business continuity. So the question here is, to what extent could you continue with your normal business activities? Um, and the, the one on the left is 2020 responses, and the one on the, um, on the right is um, uh, 2021. So that was before the June lockdown. Um, and what one can notice sort of immediately is things got better. So the red, the, the bright red are those people or businesses who said we cannot continue at all with our business activities. Um, and it's spread between face-to-face -face operations and not face-to-face, -face, freelancers, employers, and formal and informal sector. So things definitely got better in 2021. But nevertheless, there was still sort of a, a, a significant impact on um, whether you could continue with some of your business activities. The green bars here, these are the people who said, I can continue with all of or most of my business activities. You can see it's quite low percentages um, in that situation. 
Um, we also reviewed which parts of the value chain were disrupted. I spoke to that a little bit um, during the previous presentation. Um, here's some of the information from key stakeholders, um, thinking about uh, medium term and longer impacts. Um, and then what I just wanted to show you quickly was continuity strategies. So we asked, um, uh, how did you continue with your business activities as much as you could? And you can see that overall, um, like two thirds of people said that part of their strategy was moving online. Um, so pointing to the importance of the digital environment for employers, so people who were the owner of a firm, um, you can see that they did things like cancelling contracts with suppliers. So they were shutting down some of that. Um, they were closing offices. So 41% of them closed their offices and many of those have not gone back. So they still continue to work from home and ending short-term contracts. So that again shows you how um, vulnerable um, the uh, creative industries um, are. So, so this, this study was more about hearing from uh, the creative industries, practitioners themselves, businesses and freelancers, uh, what the impacts were and how they responded to that. And we used this, I'm just going to go forward kind of quickly, um, to ask them uh, about expected recovery times, so how long they thought it would take um, before they could recover. Um, and you can see that this is quite long term. Um, we also looked at vulnerability in the different domains. Um, so depending on the proportion in a particular domain that was freelance, um, and informal and operating mostly face to face. And you can see that there's a big difference, right? So, so the, the, the um, most vulnerable domain, the one that had the most um, negative impact uh, in both years was performance and celebration, right? So this is all the live music, theater and so on. Um, so this research report is also um, available um, online. Um, and I can speak more to it um, if members would like that. Um, but I thought I would just um, quickly respond to a couple of the other questions um, before handing over to um, colleagues. Um, I'll leave the international trade questions to Dr. Hose, who is an international trade um, specialist. But just briefly to comment on the use of the UNESCO framework, um, yes, the framework was published in 2009, but that doesn't mean the data is from 2009. So the framework is simply like a definition. So it's a way of um, classifying the creative industries. And we, we adapt it for the South African context and we update it um, every year. Um, but the usefulness is that it allows international comparison um, of some of our um, uh, data. So we can see how South Africa is doing in terms of creative economy contribution to GDP um, and to employment. Um, and that can be useful for kind of comparative um, policy work. Um, to the question about what research SACO has done about technology and digitization, um, we have done some, some work here. Um, there was a project a couple of years ago now looking at um, uh, the overlap between digital uh, skills and creative inputs. So we um, interviewed a, a sample of, of firms, mostly quite small firms in the creative industries, and we asked them about the skill sets that they were using. Um, very interesting study because it showed um, a really high level of mixture, right? So that. Um, companies are drawing on business skills, um, they're drawing on technology, science and tech, digital kind of skills, as well as creative skills. And it's the combination of those skills, um, what we call the fused firms, right, to fuse all these things together, um, that actually makes those companies more successful. So we, we are tracking that um, uh, change in business practice and innovation. We've also done work on um, animation and video games more recently. Um, might sound like a sort of a small sector, um, and it is, but 
um, some big reports like the Pricewaterhouse um, Coopers Entertainment and Media Industries Africa report has um, already signaled that that's a sector that's going to grow a lot in South Africa um, in the years that are coming. So they're small now, but they're, they're really getting big. And linked to that, of course, is all the um, sort of online markets around, for example, the non-fungible tokens, tokens, NFTs, um, and how those can be used to monetize um, content. Um, and then finally, uh, somebody mentioned intellectual property. Um, certainly we've done work on that. So SACO has um, drawn on the expertise of copyright lawyers for the creative industries um, to provide workshops for creatives, but also to um, provide kind of hopefully readable, well-written reports that set out what the copyright amendment bill changes will mean um, for the sector. Um, yeah, the union's question is, is one of my personal interests, I have to say, along with the NEDLAC idea. Um, so uh, one of the things that the creative industries master plan is sort of starting to address is, is exactly that. How do we get the creative industries unionized and recognized in a NEDLAC kind of environment so that their voice can be heard? Because at the moment, it's quite fragmented. Um, and so it tends to come out in these kind of protesting ways rather than in a kind of industry representative way. Um, with, uh, you know, 46% of people working in the sector working informally and most of those, or, or no, a third of those freelancers, um, it is very difficult um, to get industry organizations up and running and stable. Um, so quite often what happens is that when things become tough and people lose their jobs, then they also stop paying their industry association fees. And then the association has trouble uh, keeping going, which means that they can't support the sector. So we know that that is um, one of the labor market problems that is um, being faced. I'm afraid I can't really tell you about part-time and full-time jobs. Um, and this is partly because uh, as a freelancer, it's quite difficult to determine um, whether somebody is working part-time or full-time, um, we can sort of get a sense, I suppose, of whether someone is underemployed, you know, or um, employed uh, at capacity. Um, but that could be an interesting area for, um, for research. What we do know is that people in creative industries um, often have multiple jobs. So they, they do a whole lot of different things um, in order to um, earn their salaries. Um, the durable goods consumption, very interesting. Um, I, I suspect that that's related to things like um, computers and uh, televisions and equipment that you need to access the internet. Um, having said that, internet access is going to be one of the challenges in terms of expanding the creative industries digitally. Uh, so according to the household income and expenditure survey data, the latest that we've got, less than 10% of households have access to fixed line internet in their home. So there would be, if you include um, access in other places um, and um, cell phone kind of wireless access, um, then that goes up to around 40 or 50%. But as we know, that's very expensive data. So it might be less likely that you would be using that data to access um, music or theater or um, other kinds of creative industries um, content. Um, we expect that there will be a slowdown in consumer purchases, um, partly because uh, the economy is, is facing tough times. So um, creative industries content is often regarded as non-essential. Um, and so we expect that demand is also going to uh, going to continue to be constrained kind of in the in the near future until the economy um, recovers. Um, you are correct, honorable member, the transformation data was from 2019. Um, this is because the labor market dynamics survey comes out with a two year lag. Um, so uh, Sometime this year, we should be able to access the 2020 data, um, which will then allow us to update those numbers. 
Having said that, they don't change very radically from, from year to year. So it's the same with the gender split. So we wouldn't expect a very sudden change um, in transformation profile. It's something that seems to be happening sort of in the longer um, term. Um, to the question about the visual arts and crafts and how to use that sector for poverty reductions, uh, what could be some of the key um, interventions? Um, this is a question that we have been um, exploring um, through some detailed sort of mapping studies of what's happening, particularly in rural provinces and um, provincial municipalities. Um, so we've been looking at the patterns of um, uh, particularly visual arts and crafts and cultural and natural heritage in uh, provinces that don't have big metros. Um, and we can see that they are they are providing um, a kind of safety net there for for people who struggle to act and get into the labor market in other ways. Um, they are, however, quite dependent on tourism. And so um, the production side of things uh, can is is quite possible in a rural province, um, draws on kind of traditional uh, indigenous knowledge systems and can be really, uh, really good quality, but then how to access the market, right? So one of the ways of doing that is through tourism um, and through having kind of tourist hubs and craft hubs. Um, of course, that was very badly damaged by um, COVID-19 restrictions. And we think will continue to be um, constrained because people don't have the money to, um, to travel as much as they, um, as they did. Um, so we have done specific um, studies on, on visual arts and crafts and pointed out the policy implications um, of the findings for those areas that don't have um, big cities. Um, I think I'm going to stop there and um, just to hand over to Dr. Hoes or Dr. Liebenberg um, to find out if they want to add anything. In particular, Andrea, I'm hoping that you'll talk about some of the trade with your permission, Chair. Okay, they must do so. Thank you. Thanks, Honourable Chair, Honourable Members. Yeah, uh, at least three questions were asked on the trade while I was hey, jotting them down. Can you show your face? Can you show your face and switch off the video? When you start for the first time and then you can switch the video, we are aware of the um, network. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Honourable Chair. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I think one of the first things that I think the Nazi needs to come in, but uh, through the PS, uh, the PSP, the Presidential Economic Stimulus Package, uh, Nelson Mandela University was involved in developing um, a whole bunch of uh, uh, CCIs, uh, cultural industrial uh, industry. Uh, participants, and, and one of the components was exports. So we did do an export component on that, and that is an introduction to exports. What do exporters need or potential exporters need? The first thing is information. So there is a lot of information around, so the, the normal internet information that people get, but also information from uh, the Department of Trade, Industry and uh, Communications. There is other training also available from private sector, but also from government, from the various uh, development agencies, the provincial and uh, metro development agencies, and those are uh, invaluable. Uh, and then mentoring and, and networking exporter clubs, which uh, there are a number of which are, are being done apart from um, uh, the work that we're doing at SACO. So a lot of the initial uh, skills required for to become a successful exporter is generic, but it does become more uh, specialized after that. And I think there, there is a gap there that needs to be looked at. But I think the, uh, the next tools, next set of tools that we need to look at uh, that uh, hopefully in a post-COVID world will start resuming again are the trade missions. So trade missions are critically important. Uh, things like book fairs uh, for books are, are, are vital. And I think there's a couple of uh, projects already on the go 
where we'll be taking part in book fairs, uh, other exhibitions, and then obviously cultural seasons where there's a, a, a agreement between uh, governments, and I think the DG can talk more on that. Uh, there are also models that uh, we, we've developed in the past, but need updating. For the gravity model, which will identify potential. Mm -hmm. But I, I think one of the uh, important um, uh, markets that uh, one of the members did, uh, one of the members did allude to, was Africa. And just as an example, we, we see a, a huge growth in books going to SADC. Uh, and I think that's something that has been going on for the last uh, two or three years. And I think it's an area that South Africa should start uh, actively pursuing and finding out how we can develop it and getting the book market into Africa uh, uh, a lot better. Uh, into China, yeah, I think there's huge potential there. And I think, again, the tools that I've discussed, the uh, trade missions, uh, exhibitions, and then obviously cultural seasons will help a lot in getting our goods into China. Um, but it's not only exports that we take our goods overseas that are important. And you'll recall that when, you, when uh, Prof Snowball looked at the uh, UNESCO definition, there were two blocks at the bottom. One was sports and the other one was uh, tourism. And I think we get our tourists coming back again. I think that's a, a, a very important role at small uh, levels, uh, which will suit obviously levels uh, SMEs, especially the micro companies, um, to get their goods over. So we need to do a little bit more work there to start uh, helping developing branding, for example, and um, the, the markets to where it's going. There is a, uh, well, there's a few reports, but there is one that was done on uh, towards a export market strategy for CCIs on the website. And I'm sure we can make that available to you, Chair, uh, for distribution through to the, uh, to the honorable members. Um, uh, Honorable Mamabolo, uh, how to unlock the benefits of the CCRs? I think Prof Snowball did allude to some of them, uh, but it's important that uh, uh, when we're doing the um, master plan is a lot of effort is often put into developing the supply side. Uh, if you just develop the supply side without looking at the demand side, you're going to run into problems. So we need to do a lot of audience development, for example, to help audiences uh, to develop. So we need to look at the demand side as well as the supply side and make sure that there's a, a, a good match. Then we also need to look at the uh, markets efficiency mechanisms, how people protecting their intellectual property that they are developing. And then I think we've uh, spoken about the infrastructure and I'm sure the DG wants to speak about that. Um, uh, local content, Honorable Edmonds was speaking about the impact of local content. I think again, it's important. I think we need to get more local content onto our airwaves, uh, but it needs to be done in, in, in a managed manner so that you don't frighten off all your advertisers at the same time. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if there's any work done on that. Uh, I think you asked a question about the informal sector, Prof. Snowball's dealt with that. And with the crisis on the intervention, uh, there was, uh, well, Marnie spoke about the forecasts on CCI spending. Um, I'm not going to share screen now for saving time, but we did send a presentation on page 56 uh, where it deals with COVID. We have tried to plot the COVID uh, recovery 
uh, uh, paths uh, that we that we foresaw. So we saw, for example, an audiovisual interactive, a strong V-shaped recovery, where there was a, a big drop, but then a, um, a very rapid uh, rise. The other sectors, cultural and natural heritage, performance celebration, visual arts and crafts, and uh, uh, design and creative services had more of a U-shaped recovery. So there was a big drop, uh, a sluggish uh, dragging at the bottom, but then there is a growth. One of the areas that we are concerned about is the book sector, where there is an L-shaped recovery. And that, and, and we're concerned about that because of the decline. And then you'll recall the, uh, that pie chart um, that, was, that, that Prof. Snowball showed. Uh, with books, you'll see that it's, it's, it's becoming an ever smaller, smaller section of the CCI as a component. And uh, it can be explained in, in many ways. First of all, that lack of reading and so on, but also people are moving over to uh, digital content. Uh, we've seen big structural changes, so um, uh, uh, large uh, magazines are closing down, uh, publishers are closing down, so there, is, there, there, there are challenges there. But uh, when there's challenges, there's obviously also the opportunities that, that, that come with it. So, um, uh, Again, maybe it's a hobby also of mine, but uh, the CCIs, and this comes back to some of these other questions, how to develop the sector, also depend a lot on uh, working with uh, uh, basic and higher education uh, on, on um, developing, uh, uh, to develop the sector, to develop reading, to develop the arts, in a much uh, more coordinated and uh, uh, deliberate uh, uh, manner. But that, uh, that, that would fall out of your idea, I guess. Um, okay. Uh, Honorable uh, Madeline Sultan uh, spoke about the UNESCO framework and that it's a bit dated. Um, yes and no. So we do regularly look at the various frameworks that are around. Uh, we, um, we, we're using the UNESCO framework because South Africa does have an agreement uh, with UNESCO. There's where, something at your background which is uh, irritating. I oh, don't know yeah. what it is. Um, Please look at it. I beg your pardon. I'm sorry about that. Is it better okay. now? Yet. No, it's still, it's still doing. Oh, I'm not sure. I can't hear anything from that. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll speak quickly, then I'll, I'll get it over. But, but there are a number of frameworks that we do have. Sorry, Honorable Chair. That we, so, so there's the UNTAD framework that we're looking at very actively now as well. Uh, and then there's a WIPO, the uh, World Intellectual Property uh, Organization framework that we're looking at. And we're also looking at the other observatories around the world at what they're doing. So Sinca, the Argentinians were here just before COVID and we had long discussions with them on how they're doing it and how we can uh, work together. So the, the frameworks that we're using, um, we're, we'll try and develop a, a system in the future that will be able to give not only the UNESCO at uh, breakdowns, but all the other breakdowns as well, and make it more relevant uh, for South Africa as well. But never forgetting the, the comparative uh, that we need to report to, to UNESCO on, on where we are. Uh, Honorable Chair, I think I've covered most of the questions. I think it's one of the two that uh, the um, Executive Director of SACO might want to cover. But uh, I think those are the ones that I can do, and maybe uh, uh, Dr. Sabre can carry on as well if I have missed anything out. Okay, thank you so much. Any other intake from your side, Unati? 
Um, thank you, Honorable Chair. I think my team has captured all the questions and comments that were raised earlier by the Honorable Members of this committee. Uh, thank you, Honourable Chair. Honourable Chair, if I can just mention, sorry, the one I did mention that I did want uh, the Executive Director to look at was the uh, PSC, uh, P, uh, the Presidential Economic Stimulus Package, which I think that's quite an important yes. uh, um, must take a question. Not. Uh, Honourable Chair. Yes, yes, DG. Yes, maybe there are questions that you are directed to the department. No, I'm away. I, I will come back to you, DG. I was still wanting that you not. Uh, must uh, be clear that all the team has responded, but I'm suspecting that. Um, Unati, do you want to say the last uh, question uh, that uh, uh, Andrew is, is talking about before okay. I give DJ? <laughs> Um, all right, thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, so just to comment a bit on the Presidential Economic Stimulus Program that we implemented last year uh, on behalf of the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture. So beginning of the financial year, of the past financial year rather, um, we received um, 30 million which was approved by parliament. I cannot remember the budget vote number, um, but basically what we had to do with it, with those funds was to appoint or rather identify 100 unemployed graduates countrywide and give them work opportunities uh, within their creative industries and how that uh, was to be implemented was the department gave us a database of artists, uh, 800 artists to be exact from six provinces in the country, uh, six provinces um, that, so that's, that excluded the Gauteng province, the Western Cape and, the, and, and KwaZulu Natal. Um, these artists, um, are not the prominent artists like you, you know, like or Black Coffee and so forth, but it's it's emerging artists for, for lack of a better word. So it's artists that need um, assistance to profile their businesses so that you know the industry, um, um, the the consumers of their products are aware that they exist and where they exist and what kind of uh, business offering do they have. So we had to pay these artists with the, um, the 100 graduates, um, recently graduated um, graduates from the fields of marketing, finance, business economics, law, um, public relations, media and communications, those, those were the critical skills that are essential, um, you know, for anyone who is starting up a business to, to be equipped with how do you run your business, how do you handle your finances, how do you market your, your product, et cetera. So they went through a four months training program, uh, but because these are graduates who've recently, you know, come out of university, we had to ensure that you know they've got trainers um, themselves. So these were the experts in the various fields that they specialized in. So they had to give them the necessary training in order to ensure that they pass on the right um, information to the artists. So we ran that successfully for four months um, and we gave all the 900 beneficiaries stipends, monthly for four months, um, 6,500 rands a month for four months to all of them. So that amounted to about 26 million and something. Um, 
So they went through the program and they had to then go through an assessment towards the end of the program, which then the Nelson Mandela University Business School assisted us in evaluating, you know, the, the, the portfolio of evidence produced by the, by the graduates. We completed that program in, in January and handed over the closed out, the closed out report um, to the department. And currently we are in the process of returning back the, the surplus funds that were, were not used um, during the, the, the four months period. So that uh, is essentially what um, we were mandated to do, uh, we were asked to assist with under the Presidential Economic Stimulus Program. Thank you, Chair. Oh, thanks so much for this information on that. Uh, I'm suspecting the department uh, will give the, the, the detail in writing to you on what you have just reporting to us. Uh, DJ. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, can I ask the acting DDG, um, Madam Lisa Combrink, uh, to talk to the two questions that were directed to the department, and then um, we, I will just add uh, on the other uh, three areas, I think, that were mentioned. Uh, did you, acting DDG? Um, thank you, um, um, DG, and um, Lisa, your face first. Oh, sorry about that, um, Chairperson. Um, that's me, Chairperson, Honourable yes. Members. Yeah. <laughs> yes, please, sir. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, Chairperson, there are just a few questions that I wanted to address. I think the questions were asked by Honourable um, Dennis and Honourable Nklongo. Um, the first one is around the mandate of um, SARCO and also the budget of SARCO. Um, I think the, just to in brief to say, Chairperson, um, SARCO was conceived firstly in 2011. It, it, it was activated in 2015 um, with a tender awarded for the research work to Nelson Mandela University. Um, who were, and they were working in partnership with Rhodes Fort and Fort Hare University. Um, in 2018, um, which is the current contract that we're talking about, um, Nelson Mandela University um, was also awarded this contract and working in partnership with Rhodes University, Fort Hare and the University of KwaZulu-Natal. So the, so the actual contract is for a five year period and the value of the contract is at 70 million rands. The current contract will expire in March 2023. So that addresses the budget issue. But in terms of the mandate, what the department has envisaged um, as the important role of the observatory is firstly to champion evidence. So that um, you know, the observatory becomes our primary source for collecting cultural statistics, key indicators, assessing the value of the sector, tracking trends over time. Um, secondly, also to be able to influence policy, inform future policy resource allocation decisions. So for example, in that regard, SACO is also presented at strategic sessions of the department. So it can, it's so that the department can be responsive um, to, the, to the evidence on the ground, to the economic realities, um, but also regularly holding workshops with um, the department as well. Um, so in that way, policy is influenced, but there are really two more areas. And the third one is also to share these insights with others. Therefore, SACO has um, a website, but the website also becomes some kind of almost online archive where all the research um, information and the documents are loaded. Um, Asako also has its own online magazine um, where it distributes um, information to quite a big database of creatives around the country and beyond. 
It's also trying to work with other African countries and elsewhere in the world in terms of building cultural observatories. Um, but um, fourthly, it's also there to build capacity and therefore to provide capacity workshops to strengthen the capacity of arts, culture, heritage practitioners. Um, so there have been a lot of educational opportunities, exchange for information. The observatory, the observatory does quarterly um, sort of workshops with a whole range of stakeholders. Um, and then just to add to what um, our colleagues in Circo have said, um, important part of their work is also impact studies to look at the work that's done by the department, projects supported by the department, and to try and take a sort of objective look at what is the impact, um, how successful are these projects. So that's part of their work. But, but, but finally, I, I, I wanted to point to something that I think the researchers have been very modest about today, Chairperson, and that is that they are also quite innovative in terms of the work that's been done here in South Africa um, by ourselves. Um, they've not really spoken about this, but they've also begun to, out of this current mapping study, establish a very innovative vulnerability index. Um, you know, and I think it would be good to hear a little bit more about that chairperson from them themselves. And finally, I wanted to indicate um, there was the question of where is SACO like located in the structure of the department. Um, it's located in the arts culture um, promotion branch. Um, it is um, it is sort of funded through the chief directorate of um, cultural development, Mr. Charles Mabasso, who is also in this meeting with us this morning, um, and it's funded. Um, as one of the pillars of the Mzanzi Golden Economy Strategy. Um, so thank you, Chairperson. Those were the questions that I needed to answer. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you so much, Dichi. Um, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Um, just to indicate the following issues that were covered uh, in the question. Lisa has covered a lot uh, in terms of the mandate as well as the location. Uh, what I just needed to respond to now, Chair, is uh, the issue of the improvement of the local content, uh, particularly in the music, so that uh, there is a greater uh, consumption as well as revenue for the creatives. Uh, I think Honorable is on point, and we agree uh, that uh, we we do have to continue to drive this uh, just to assure the committee that as a department we have indeed and, and continue to engage with SAPC, um, uh, but also with ICASA on this matter. Uh, what they have indicated, Chairperson, um, uh, to our response to the, to, to the department and the sector on this issue, was that, in fact, they are uh, playing more than 90% uh, almost of the local content on their stations. And they started with the radio stations, uh, where they gave us a breakdown in relation to the regional stations, uh, whether it's on Shobo and then whether it's on Kose, uh, even with the issues of the independent stations, uh, that there is a shift there uh, on the metros of this uh, world, uh, the radio 2000s. They, they do, and um, uh, ICASA does monitor that, and they're utilizing those quota systems that they are expected to meet. Uh, but we continue to look into this matter, and uh, our discussion uh, with the Department of Communications and Technology as well as in uh, SAPC, was to also look at uh, further encouraging this uh, by uh, seeing whether it is not possible to have some dedicated uh, um, even TV stations that just uh, focuses on the issues of local music as well as uh, um, uh, creative arts and sport. And it is uh, something that uh, we are engaging to see whether 
those other methods can assist in ensuring that there is greater consumption of local content and therefore revenue generation in terms of royalties uh, for the sector. But also, Chairperson, uh, in dealing with this, we have to look at the end uh, um, point of how to we get this money back to the artist when it is played, including the issues of repeats, uh, that there has been a very little uh, that uh, gets back to the creatives uh, or even the producers of such music. And then the indication is that we also need to engage more with the collection societies uh, in order to have a hold on to the money for some two for some time before they disperse this back to the artists. Because even if there was more music being played uh, on air, uh, if or even on TV, but if the money does not get to the artists in time, um, then there is a long waiting period uh, which then makes them suffer. So we were looking at both issues of uh, air time or nearly time uh, that is available, uh, but also how can this money get back to the artists quicker by engaging with the collection society, particularly during the COVID-19. So we agree on this issue that there must be continuous push, uh, but um, because of those quota systems that they are meeting, and that they were able to demonstrate both their monitor that they do so. But we think there are more other alternative ways uh, to achieve this. And that is why we're engaging with them as well as the collection societies on these matters. Now, the issue of focus on trade uh, with the West and uh, well as a Europe rather than Africa, and uh, we, we think uh, there are greater opportunities, chairpersons, now than ever before. And um, on the issue of the Africa Free Continental Trade Agreement, there are just few protocols when we're looking at that need to be finalized. Uh, because if that is done, the issue of tariffs and the import duties that are placed on our content and our products, uh, might then uh, be, if they are waived, it will make us um, uh, to these markets in Africa much better uh, because we must always remember that we are guided by those trade agreements uh, that uh, assist in terms of what we can export and how much at what tariff. And uh, it will always help to have uh, less um, uh, taxation uh, or import duties uh, that will then uh, uh, create and pave the way for greater market access uh, to our cultural products as well as services uh, to the African uh, continent as a whole. Uh, so that uh, we know that we stand at home uh, because that's where charity begins. And, but we have not um, set on our laurels to person on this matter. We have continued to look at uh, what MGE asks us to do. And those are four areas, creating demand, ensuring that there is greater market access, and well as ensuring that uh, the audience development happens for our artists. And we do these things uh, in terms of touring ventures, uh, when we allow and enable our active artists to be our creatives to go out of the country uh, and be able to uh, utilize their work. As we speak now, the Venice Biennale is one of those uh, where the artists are the finite artists. We just uh, had a huge exploitation of the uh, Dubai Expo uh, to make sure that you export our cultural and uh, uh, creative work and also we then have what we call cultural seasons in which we also have partnerships uh, uh, with the other countries uh, in which then the products are exhibited uh, to those countries and then uh, creating demand for Africa, South Africa's cultural goods. But further than that, Jefferson, we also do provide opportunities in terms of uh, uh, the artists uh, that we will support uh, when we've got, um, uh, whether it is film or video, uh, particularly with the protocols we enter into with the press countries. And uh, we will work hard uh, to make sure that uh, South Africa's products uh, in the press countries, which is raised by Mr. Honor uh, Mamabul, and uh, that we use that opportunity. Because if you look at India and China alone, uh, they run into almost 3 billion people 
that means that the opportunities are bigger. Uh, we are cut off only about 60 million. So that is why then the, we believe that this uh, partnership with BRICS uh, is one of the greatest opportunities for market access to export our goods in this regard. And we do have this partnership uh, and MOUs with these countries, five or with the four of them, uh, because we are the fifth country in the BRICS sector. Uh, if you had Brazil, um, uh, you, you know then that you've got huge opportunities for South Africa's cultural goods and services. Now, the issues of a uh, uh, crisis in the set, I think uh, the colleagues from SACO have answered that adequately about uh, what they did during COVID, and uh, that assisted us then to look at PSP, the issues of relief, as well as now dealing with the issue of economic recovery and um, and, and, and uh, as well as they show the C CI master plan, which is currently through cabinet processing, uh, so that we know where to, to intervene. Uh, and that is all based on the uh, work that uh, they have provided to us. Minister has captured this very well on the role of SACO, that you cannot manage what you can measure. Uh, but he even further went on to say, if we were to create adaptation strategies that are effective and be designed to support uh, the sector, then we need SACO's work to give us evidence-based outcomes on where to intervene. The last part, Chairperson, was uh, the issue of geographical spread uh, that was raised by Honorable Dennis. Uh, also here, um, we believe and we agree uh, uh, that is why the revised word paper also have addressed this issue of how we should really reposition and reprioritize our resources. Our budget is extremely limited, but how do we make sure that uh, we move away from the skewness of favoring the two provinces in particular, plus one uh, to some extent, and uh, just distribute our interventions uh, to this uh, provinces that are rural and uh, are usually ignored uh, based on our historical um, uh, um, way of doing things and uh, where we come from. So we take that into account and we will uh, continue to adjust how we resource these areas, like what was a SACO uh, executive director saying that uh, in their intervention on the PSP, only uh, there were provinces that were excluded because they were already having a lot of benefit uh, than the other provinces. Hence, they were excluded even in that intervention to support artists outside. Uh, and lastly, I think the issue of, uh, I don't know if um, the issue of composition of SACO uh, was, uh, was explained in relation to how uh, SACO is constituted and that uh, includes, um, of course, uh, from the side of the department, uh, we're dealing with the governance issues uh, where we've got a steering committee uh, that was appointed, um, which works then with the SACO executives uh, to make sure that uh, the composition uh, in relation to governance is, uh, is, is balanced with the people who are from the sector being uh, participating at the level of the steering uh, committee. And they are mandated to execute it. There is always what we call developing a market, um, sorry, the research proposal that we then approve uh, for the particular financially to say these are the areas of research that must be covered. And uh, then they will do that research. What has been good so far has been their adaptability uh, when there were emerging challenges in the sector, uh, like when the issue of sport was never part of that, but when we had the major, then the issue of sport, we asked them to begin to incorporate uh, some areas on that. Uh, but that is how we've been developing the research schedule so that there is predictability. They know for a particular year which areas of research we want done and then we agree on those, and then they will deliver them as per the approved business plan uh, by, between us and them. Chairperson, we agree with the surplus issue uh, of trade. While it is welcome, we need to do more um, uh, to make sure that there is greater appetite 
for South Africa's products. Uh, um, maybe Saiko will have to consider then the challenge of dissecting the information more uh, about uh, what products are consumed more in Africa and therefore then uh, what are the new market opportunities for also new products that we can market more uh, in Africa. And then we look at which countries uh, like we have done a very detailed analysis in terms of trade and which areas we are trading on. But I want to clarify that this is not deliberate, Jefferson, that Europe would consume more as well as the West and uh, or even China in terms of that, because and those are the people who might have a greater interest. What it means is that our intervention must be how do we market our work so that the other continents uh, are aware and are able to appreciate the goods that we provide. And it's not just about beauty of the goods, but durability of the goods, so that they are then seen as worthy investments by those uh, uh, citizens of those uh, countries and those economies. So that is what we believe we can still do. We will continue to try to achieve, to have a diverse, diversified market for our products in the other countries and then it increase more exports and reduce the deficit that we we want to really turn over reverse. That is uh, I think Jefferson uh, on that we 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 were asked to respond to at this stage. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Tichi. May may I have just a few questions also uh, I would love uh, to ask this following question. What is the de demographic composition from a race, class, and gender perspective of the cultural and creative industry? Exports beyond geographical, uh, as uh, Honorable Dennis was asking, geographic spread, as it is evident that here in the Western Cape, it dominates exports at 53.1%, whilst it constitutes 12.3% of the gross value add of cultural and creative industry. Having said that, what are the distinct features and configuration of the cultural and creative industry in Western Cape, which enables it significant trade links and how can these be duplicated to other geographic areas of uh, areas to address the inequality the last uh, question that I, I want to uh, pose uh, since 2007 the creative economy has relatively declined and cultural occupations over time have been constant what has led to the relatively sluggish performance of the creative economy and cultural occupation and sharp increase of cultural goods trade from uh, 2003 to 2007? And why did the trade stagnate to the current decline pattern? Uh, I, I, I don't see any other hand because uh, I didn't raise any question. Uh, I'm suspecting if there are any follow-ups, this is the time to do that. In, uh, I've seen the hand of Honorable Madlingozi. Okay. Uh, Honorable Madlingozi. Honorable Adams. In that order. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, my, my my, my my question would be also, um, you see, one one of the slides the uh, the presentation had about the the employers, um, uh, uh, the the you know the the margin is small, but what uh, what 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 I want to find out is um, what is the picture, uh, uh, you know that that is painted by by Sako Ori. Uh, the the gender, race, and 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 the age of of, of the employers in in the in the creative sector, and um, the 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 other question that 
I want to ask, actually, it's, it's what is what you've, you've asked, Chairperson. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Honorable Marshall Gosen. Honorable Adams. Thank you, Chairperson. Chair, Chairperson, my question will only be to, to the department. Um, how will the department use this report in its resource allocation to optimize the op opportunities globally and to grow the culture and creative economy grows in all geographic locations in the country. And the last one, Chair, has the department implement a cultural diplo diplomacy policy framework and what outcomes have been realized? I thank you, Chair. Thank you, honorable members. Uh, can I give it to the circle and the DJ must, must come at the end. Unati, your team, Unati. Please, okay. Honorable Marlingos and Honorable Adams, lower your hands. Thank you, Honorable Chair. I'd like to ask Dr. Andre Hoyes to respond to the issue of. Um, the the exports and the demographic makeup uh, within the provinces, in particular Western Cape, um, if it is contained in the mapping study. And then maybe on the cultural diplomacy, uh, Dr. Sabit Lebenberg, if you can respond to that. Thank you. Thank you, Unati. Thanks, Honorable Chair. Uh, yeah, the, the one about the uh, cultural occupations is uh, a, a very difficult one to give in a short sentence because so what we have done is we've broken it down uh, by gender, uh, by race, by province, by age, and we've done those all individually. So in the report itself, uh, all those uh, different classifications are included. We did play around a long time trying to put them all into one table, into one graph, but the trouble is as soon as you try and do that to capture all those different dimensions, it starts getting um, uh, really complicated. We can do that if, if there's a request for it, we can, we can try and do it again, but I think if if uh, if the honourable members can just look at uh, chapter two of the employment and transformation uh, mm -hmm. chapter, I think the data is uh, that was requested is all there, uh, but maybe not um, okay. with uh, with dimensions included and integrated as much as possible. Um, I forget what the trade question was, uh, but maybe uh, Dr. Lindenberg can answer that as well. Uh, or we can come back to that. Nancy. Um, thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, Dr. Sabin Lebenberg, if you are in the room, can you yes. kindly respond to the cultural diplomacy comment and question. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson and, and members. Um, cultural diplomacy really is a, is a very, very important element of, of expanding our trade onto the continent and, and globally. Um, and to this effect, the, the department has requested a number of evidence-based reports to underpin uh, what needs to take place within our broader culture diplomacy environment. Um, so the Cultural Observatory had first of all produced a position paper that provided an understanding of where Cultural Observatory is, what's happening globally, where it came from, um, who are the main players and what kind of approaches and methods and instruments do they use. Uh, that was followed by a second report um, and that report focused primarily on a potential policy framework within which to encase uh, a cultural diplomacy uh, policy. As you can understand, cultural diplomacy obviously deals with foreign, uh, our foreign relations and our national interests. So it would definitely be in co concurrence and transversal cooperation between DERCO, 
the presidency and, and the department uh, and, and of course the DTI um, and tourism. So there's a whole bunch of departments that would have to uh, work together. Um, the third uh, major piece of work that we had done in terms of cultural diplomacy is we did a review of the phenomenon of um, cultural centers and how these cultural centers are being deployed as part of a general soft power uh, diplomacy around the globe. And we looked at uh, which nations were doing what and what their, their deployments were. And we also then identified some of the key policy issues that um, would have to be dealt with. Uh, we've also consistently supported the department and the DGs, particularly when it comes to overseas contacts where we would support by providing uh, cultural briefing documents to the, to, to the ministry and to the DG's office uh, and through the project team, where we would analyze the cultural, observa uh, cultural economies of, of various, various countries. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, do you think that you have answered all the questions? Maybe let me get it to the DG because I'm suspending uh, from my questions. I, I didn't hear uh, all of the responses, did you? No, thanks very much, Chairperson. Uh, it, it is my understanding that uh, what gives uh, Western Cape the competitive edge yeah. it, it, mm -hmm. uh, has been the issues of, uh, firstly, uh, they are, they've got, uh, for instance, in terms of the film industry, uh, most of the uh, are short in the Western Cape. There are people who are talking uh, uh, to behind. They must. Uh, that's a. <laughs> uh, DJ, don't mute yourself. Tell those people they must not make noise. DJ. Sorry about that, Chair. I was then indicating, uh, Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members, that uh, competitive advantage that is the uh, Western Cape seems to have has been one of the issues of the scenery in the film studios uh, that mm. have attracted a lot of um, uh, filmmakers uh, to have uh, shoots at that place, um, uh, among other issues, but also in terms of fine art uh, that they produce there. And, uh, and the artists that are really uh, well placed in that area seem to export more of their goods than uh, any other region uh, in their country. And they are able to then have a greater market access. Uh, Some them. question, Nina. Are you on the road? Uh, no, Chepes, in the venue that I am at, uh, I don't know, we've tried, but they say they are working. And it okay, okay, I'll go on. Yes, Chairperson. Maybe okay. I must thank you for the opportunity yeah. and appreciate that uh, Sako was given a chance to present. Uh, I think the rest um, uh, we will respond in uh, some other time, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for teaching. Honorable members, uh, this is our first time to have uh, such informative information which uh, uh, we are appreciated as these committee members. And uh, I'm suspecting before your, your term and March 2023, we'll call you furthermore uh, through department. Uh, we do appreciate to get uh, what, what we are doing and uh, will will be looking at our program uh, maybe uh, come uh, next uh, financial year uh, in order that we must get to know what happened if you are retaining surplus uh, and then in this financial year, how much are you going to get and what are you going to do with that? But the, the appreciation of prioritizing the imaging uh, artist that, uh, which is a graduate, that you, you taking care of them through all what you have reported to us. With the, at this point, 
uh, let me thank the UNATI and the, all the leaders who are with them in this meeting. We've gained a lot. We're not even aware what is this subcorp, but by now we know what is this animal. Whilst we are not animals. Thank you so much, uh, Unati, and your team. Thank you so much, Honorable Chair, and to the rest of the committee and the department for, for the invite today and for lending us your ear. Thank you so much. Well, we can release you. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Gigi, you want to say something? No, Chairperson, I was saying thanks, and uh, we really appreciate the feedback, uh, and we'll continue to strengthen our working relationship with SACO so that we can be able to respond on evidence um, uh, that is available there and reposition our data to really play a crucial economic role and the well as in the fight against the triple challenge of unemployment, uh, poverty, and inequality. And that is the same in a position of being fully transformed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, DG. You are released, all of you. Thank you. Uh, Jabu, please uh, put a uh, the next item on the on the screen in order that we must deal with it. Uh, Uh -uh, go down. Go down. Yes. Aye. Up. Up. And then here we are. Uh, what is left now, uh, Jab? Okay, Chair. Um, good day again, members. Uh, Chairperson, so today is the 20th we've met with SACO already. Okay. Uh, next week, we won't be having a committee meeting uh, as the parliamentary program has indicated that it's leave period. So next week, we won't be having any committee meetings. And then on the 3rd of May, Chair, we return. Just a moment, Chabu. Can't members uh, uh, ask the... the, the, the um the office to present uh, the, the program, which we didn't deal with it yesterday, that we must start with it before we get to uh, the, the, the entire program. I'm proposing that, honorable members. Chair, can you see Dennis yet? <clears throat> Sorry to interrupt. Can you just repeat that, Chairperson, again? The statement you made now, or I didn't catch up what you, exactly what you were saying. Uh, I'm suspecting maybe what I'm proposing is what Ujabu is doing, which we didn't do it yesterday. Ne, Jabu? Yes, Chair, this is the second term uh, committee program, Chair. Okay, okay, go, go on, Jabu. Okay, Chair. So on the 3rd of, uh, of May, the next meeting will take place on the 3rd of May, we'll be receiving a briefing by the department on the 2021-2022 third quarter performance report. And we will consider and adopt committee minutes. And then on the fourth, we'll have to ask for a permission to sit again on the Wednesday chair to do the briefing on the by the Department of Sport, Arts and Culture on the 2022-2023 annual performance plan. Uh, this is to prepare us chair for the budget vote report. Hence, we are doing two meetings in that week. And then on yeah. the Tuesday of the 10th of May, we have to consider and adopt the budget vote report, vote 37. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we'll also receive a briefing, uh, a briefing by the National Heritage Council 
on the 2022-2023 annual performance plan and other matters, in particular the appointment of the Heritage Council Administrator. Um, Chair, I would also like to just point out before we move forward that on from the 10th of May, plenaries begin at 10 a.m. Uh, parliamentary plenaries begin at 10 a.m. Therefore, we'll have to um, seek permission to sit um, on the 10th and the 17th of May because there are plenaries beginning early that, those days. So if we get approval, we'll be meeting with the NHC on the 10th. And then on the Tuesday, 17th of May, we'll be doing, up, uh, we'll be doing a follow-up meeting with uh, SARU on outstanding matters and report on the legal fees. Saru will have to pay relating to the matter. And then we we'll consider and adopt the committee minutes. And then on the 24th of May, there will be a briefing by Netball World Cup Board and the executive of Netball South Africa on a detailed report about preparations for 2023 Netball World Cup. And we'll consider the minutes as well. And then Tuesday, the 31st of May, there'll be a briefing by the National Library of South Africa on the 2022-2023 annual performance plan and other matters, in particular the latest whistleblower case, Cisco initiative, and also a briefing by the department and the National Library of South Africa on the vandalism and closure of libraries. And then we'll consider and adopt the minutes there as well. And then Tuesday, the 7th of June, um, we'll be doing a briefing by the department on the memorandum of understanding between the government of uh, the Kingdom of Lesotho and the government of RSA on cooperation in the field of sport and recreation. And also we'll be receiving a briefing by the department on the memorandum of understanding between South Africa and Palestine on cooperation in the field of youth and sport. And then on the 14th of June, There'll be a briefing by the department on the agreement and explanatory memorandum to the agreement between the government of uh, South Africa and the government of Cuba on the cultural exchange and cooperation, which was tabled in terms of section 23, subsection three of the constitution of 1996. And then there'll also be a briefing by the department on the agreement between the government of South Africa and the government of the Federative Republic of Brazil on audiovisual co-production tabled in terms of section 231, subsection three of the constitution, 1996. And then we'll also have the consideration and adoption of the minutes. And then we would be going into the constituency period chairperson um, from, from the 20th of May to the 15th of August. Yeah. This is guided by the parliamentary um, program. The program yes, yeah. Honorable members, this is the program that we try to squeeze everything which is urgent, outstanding from our meetings. Uh, now I'm giving you the chance of talking to the uh, proposed program. Uh, or may I ask that the program must be adopted, honorable members? Chairperson? Uh, yes. Oh, there's one hand before you, honorable Dennis. Honorable yes. boy, Mama Bulo. Yeah, thanks, Chairperson. Well, uh, it looks good, but we must also add uh, what to call, maybe in the next quarter. We should have uh, some uh, some what to call some visits um, to other areas besides uh, us going to um, Eastern Cape this quarter. There is a softball stadium that, that um, they are building here in Polokwane. I think uh, maybe when uh, the progress is about fifty percent, we should go and visit uh, next quarter. For this, but for this one, I'll move for adoption, uh, honorable chairperson. I don't know. What are you meeting Safa? Uh, maybe I missed the point on Safa here. I want to check something. Do you have Safa this quarter? No. Secretary? No, 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 Mr. Wabu, we don't have Safa this quarter. No. Yeah, because last time we met them, it was last year. But it's fine. Maybe next quarter, let's meet Safa. Because some we did meet and others we did meet. But for now, I'll move for adoption and support the program. 
Yeah, we need to have staff, man. I got uh, this. Uh, what you call qualifications are starting soon off Afcon, so must get their program. Okay. Okay. Thank no you. Te- thank you. No te- honorable Mama Bulo, honorable Denise, honorable Denise. Thank you. Chairperson, I wanted also to bring up the point of oversight. So I support the members, the members concerned raised about oversight as well um, in, in the time when it's when it's possible. And then, of course, um, just on another point, uh, not not this uh, agenda points here, but we also have to at some stage just look as a committee at the tracking documents that is outstanding. Um, but that's just a general comment I'm making now. But my point was just for the oversight visits uh, comment. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Honorable Adams. Thank you, Chairperson. Before I uh, second on the adoption, proposal of adoption, I just wanted to get clarity on, um, uh, we discussed uh, oversight to the Northern Cape before we go on recess. If, if the secretary can just give us uh, um, information regarding that and um, uh, if I can propose that we can uh, do it in the next quarter also. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Honorable uh, Adams. Honorable Adams, uh, you have seconded. And uh, Honorable Members, uh, let's talk about our uh, oversight in the, in the next quarter. As these uh, um, members and as a chairperson who are sitting with the office, uh, uh, Exactly what you are saying, Honorable Dennis. We do look and and priorities that were uh, raised by the committee members, and then that's why here today we are prioritizing. Uh, we are aware that when we were about to go to Northern Cape, uh, we, the program of Parliament has been changed. We've noted even yesterday that uh, the, the two members of the committee propose the oversight visit. So the, the staff of the committee and, and myself will look at all the proposal by honorable members and will come back to this committee in order that uh, we must get a mandate uh, uh, on, on, the, on the proposal and on the implementation of uh, those proposals. But we are noting uh, your contributions uh, will sit and very soon will be giving uh, uh, the, the, the program back to the committee. Uh, but uh, the, the oversight is very important uh, uh, to us all. And let me take this opportunity to thank all the members who contributed today and who proposed uh, some uh, important things that we must add in our next program. Can honorable members thank the, the staff of this committee who always uh, on toes. Without the staff of this committee, I'm um, uh, really, as a chairperson, I don't think that I was going to cope and assist you uh, in order that I must channel uh, this committee. Uh, I do call them even Sundays, even on, and on holidays, because I don't want to fail uh, this committee with, uh, of the uh, members who are very serious about uh, the, the, this committee. By those words, can I now say that I declare meeting closed? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Leadership. And thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you to the staff. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you, Nafi Daifa. Thank you. Bye. Bye.